This is the Comfortably Zone Radio Network, and it is time for According to Fastball John and David Jordan. Take it away, guys. Hi, this is John DiAquisto for another round of According to Fastball John with my co-host, Dave Jordan. So today we're going to be discussing the rivalries of baseball, new and old rivalries, and some of the un, unheard of rivalries that some of us aren't aware of. So with that at hand, this is another round of According to Fastball John with talking MLB rivalries. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Johnny, happy Super Sunday. What's going on over there? Oh, just uh, kind of relaxing, uh, getting ready to watch the uh, Super Bowl, and uh, which uh, is going to be a very interesting game. And yeah. Uh, yeah. and today's subject is probably going to be very interesting also. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. We were hoping that there were going to be uh, some decent rivalries um, in, 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 the, uh, in the, big, uh, the big game, as, as they call it in some circles. You know, we were hoping that we got a couple of good games in the um, championship series. Um, and the, the AF, AFC championship game was supposed to be great between uh, the Patriots and the Steelers. Didn't quite yep. turn out that way. Today should be exciting uh, between New England and the Atlanta Falcons. I'm not so sure that it's one of the great rivalries, so um, yes. it's unfortunate. But but what it is, it, it, at the end of the, uh, the NFL season, signals the beginning of, of our time, of the real national pastime. Yeah. Um, regardless of what the ratings say, and uh, you know, it's time to start thinking about the different rivalries that have that have happened that are both natural and unnatural. Yeah, and, uh, but um, one thing, a, one thing, did you know, David, that Matt Ryan was a baseball player also? Matty Ice was from uh, Exton, Pennsylvania, close to where um, where I live for a spell. Um, I did not know he was such. I know Brady. There's there's a lot of talk of Brady. Uh, being, Brady uh, was a baseball to... player too, so they're both guys that played baseball at one time, and yeah. and it, it's an interesting concept uh, because Ryan they they had a story about R- Matt Ryan the other day about him uh, almost signing to play baseball, and oh. uh, I, I thought that was rather interesting, but oh, uh, yeah. but sorry for 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 the interrupt, but go ahead and continue with what you with what you were saying there. No, I, I think that there, uh, you know, after our conversation, we were chit-chatting during the week about rivalries and whatnot, and I started taking a look, and I was speaking with some, some folks in, in the blogosphere and, and on the Internet, and uh, there's this one wonderful site, highheatstats.com, and um, it, 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 its founder, uh, Andy, was uh, chatting with me about um, the records, the head-to-head records between certain teams. Correct. And, uh, if you go on baseballreference.com and actually um, – We'll post a link on that. So it's not it's not everywhere where you find this, it's, but um, but it's basically the head-to-head records between all 32 franchises, and, and not simply you know the Oakland A's versus the Texas Rangers, but rather the Oakland, Kansas City, and um, and Philadelphia A's versus say the Minnesota Twins, as well as the uh, Washington Senators. Uh, their Cor- correct uh, franchise name and logo. Um, yes. So it is pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, it is, and most of the teams that you and I were talking about earlier were only about 500. Nobody really ran away with the rivalries. They're a couple of games apart, maybe 500 out of a thousand games, 500 here, 500 there. You know, it's like you would think that maybe one team would really have the upper hand, but that's why there is a rivalry. They always end up beating each other, and mm-hmm. in one series, especially at on the home park front. You know they'll eat they'll eat that team up at home, but then go back to their home front and get beat. Yeah, yeah, that happens quite often. You saw yep. with the Yankees with um, you know they they had a, a five sixty nine record, and then you would think the Baltimore Orioles with, with their their same teams with um, with Earl Weaver in the late sixties and, and early seventies and, and early eighties and, and their their championship in, in eighty three, um, but they were really wretched. St. Louis Brown season thrown in there, so they're still not even about 500 uh, as a lifetime franchise. Yep, that's right. Exactly. You know, it's it's interesting, and with that, we're, we'll start we'll start at the uh, at the forefront of uh, uh, 
uh, one of the biggest rivalries in baseball. That there are two of them that we know of, and the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox ring a bell with me is one of the biggest on the East Coast. And then mm-hmm. all this, and also you have the other rivalry with the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants, my team. Uh, that has been an up and standing uh, <laughs> rivalry for years. You know, those, oh, two, those two do not like each other. Let me just put it plain and simple. There is no love loss between the Dodgers and, and the Giants, and there is no love loss between the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. It, it, it is almost identical. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to the, uh, the Yankees and, and, and both Sox in a moment. You know, the, the Giants sport a. Uh, Winning percentage about 536 for their lifetime uh, existence. Um, but versus the Dodgers, and we're talking 20, less, a little less than 2,300 games here, 25 nights separation, 25. And wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And, and the Dodgers, yeah. you know, they, they have a uh, winning percentage, uh, something along the lines of 524, um, and they are on the losing end of that. The Giants seem and, – and when you talk to Dodgers fans, and, and, you know, I know a few of my Dodger friends uh, in California, they always say the Giants just somehow always have the Dodgers on them. Yep. And Very true. Even, even before the World Championships of the past eight, eight or nine years that the, the Giants have enjoyed, you know, it's, oh, they've always had their number. You know? Yep. And, uh, well, I could and remember. Then, I could remember when I played on the on the Giants in '74. They'd come up to our park, and we would beat them in the ninth inning, on, on, yeah. on like a grand slam home run walk off, you know. And, and yeah. they would walk. They'd walk off off the field with their heads and their tails between their legs, you know. It, yeah. This went on all the time, and we were like a third place ball club or a fifth place ball club, but we always played good against the Giants. Yeah, always. Oh, and then there's a lot more to get into on that one. Um, but here's my thought. The Yankees and the Red Sox, you can never count the Yankees out. And, and that was a big thing when they had the core four going, when they had everybody really in the mix in, in the early 2000s, that you just could never make an error. You could never not take advantage of, of a basic loaded opportunity. You always had to get at least two or three runs against them because they always figured out a way to win. And, oh, exactly. And it, they still they don't have an amazing team right now. They're in, you know for for them they're in a, something of a um, you know a rebuilding process. But mm-hmm. still they spent 86 million for for five years of uh, Chapman to bring him back. I mean they yep. really think that they can make a good run for it at least get into the wild card. And it really I mean in in, in the small sam- sample size sweepstakes of the postseason anything can happen. And if you have a, a great bullpen. You can go far into the postseason, so I, I can almost understand yeah. why they made um, the expenditure for Chapman. Um, you know, and, and we'll see how it works out. Uh, well, so they, Sox, but, they, but yeah, the Red Sox you had that they countered with uh, with Chris Sally, and and yeah. and you know, and that was a big big hook for them. Uh, getting uh, some call him Sally, some call him Sale, but yeah. anyway. He's going to sail his way into a lot of uh, victories because left-handed pitchers seem to pitch pretty good in Boston, and you know, and, and he's the type of pitcher that runs the ball away from the hitters, the right-handers. So he's going to get a lot of balls hit to deep center, which is the no no man's land in Boston Red Sox Fenway Park. And you know, I that Boston Red Sox club and John John Farrell being the manager, you know, really come up to be a very very strong team this year with the addition of Chris Sale. You know what I love about Sale? Um, his, home, his home ERA, 3 spot 8 eight, is uh, ERA on the road. Two eight yep. Seven. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's going to really uh, – he, he should do well. He should do well in turn life. And he should yeah. do well for that spot. And, and, and getting getting out of at the cell, um, he, should, uh, he should put up – he can continue to put up awesome numbers. Yes, I I totally agree with that. Totally agree. I don't know how it's going to affect him with the loss of David Ortiz, but I'm sure they filled that bill pretty good too. So yeah, I mean they brought in Mitch Moreland, and and he does have his defensive bona fides. He's going to do all right, uh, you know, in the field. I mean, but, but man, Pappy, what what a year he has going out. Yeah, he did. 
I mean, it's, better, it's better than Ted Williams' final season. It, it, it's one of the great final seasons in baseball history. Yeah, yeah it is. Count. Yeah, it is. Definitely. No, he's he's a great player. He's a great player. Love his commercials, too, on TV with the tennis racket. I, I never laughed so hard when I first saw it. But, it, you know, David David was a big asset for baseball and for Boston. And I'm sure he'll still be in the area and still be coming to the ballpark and still being around to help that team, you know, in some way, shape, or form. Just being in his presence, being around, has a lot to do with that team performing well, you know. 40, 48 doubles at the age of 40. Amazing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say 48 doubles at the age of 48. Hey, maybe that would have been a better way to go, huh? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that, that, if, if they had had Julio Franco and played him for 600 plate appearances, that might have been the case. But uh, There you go. There you go. Yeah. One of the greats um, of all time, Julio Franco. Yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we're, we're looking at some of the other um, rivalries in the, on the East Coast. And here's one that, that that's kind of, you know, a little out at, at of at a source, but um, we're talking the, the both Orioles once again, and the yeah. Washington Nationals, and 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 there's been so many. I mean, you can you can go on the web and, and read up on on the situations with their um with their broadcast uh, mm-hmm. with their broadcast rights and how it's you know it's one station and whatnot. But um, you know, it, it's one market. You know, and Washington has always been you know the market for the both Orioles. And once uh, the national the national moved down there, and they made the ballpark so accessible. I mean, it's 10 minutes from the capital by foot, and it's really it's easy for nearly anybody to get to. And, um, you know, it's really kind of put a, put a cramp in the style of uh, the Baltimore franchise. Yes, absolutely. When Washington showed up on the scene, it, it, it dove into the market of the Baltimore Orioles. And, you know, it really upset the Baltimore Orioles a lot when they showed up. Uh, it's been an ongoing battle between both teams, especially with the Washington Nationals and the Orioles both playing well and and gathering enough of the marketplace. And, you know, it's, it's a tough decision sometimes for, for the media market. You know, who are we going to go with? Who are we going to side with? What is it going to be Fox? Is it going to be a local station? Is it going to be cable TV, pay TV? It's a, a hard decision for both clubs, you know, to have to battle for that for that TV right, and mm-hmm. that created the rivalry along with that battle. That is the key reason for that rivalry now. It's the bragging yeah. rights to get that TV media. You know, yeah. it's yeah. interesting, very unique it rivalry. <laughs> oh. Media driven rivalry, is a fact. <laughs> it, you can almost call it a, a traffic related rivalry. It's a pain in the neck to get to both places. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, from from one to the other, you know, and, and, and going to, um, you know, everybody talks about uh, how Camden Yards was the first of the, the new school, old school uh, ballparks. Yes. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience to go there right near the Inner Harbor. But just, yep. just trying to get there down 95, and, you know, as, as an East Coast guy, it's such an asshole. Uh, yeah, it's, especially at the end of the day when you're just about ready to start heading towards the ballpark for a seven o'clock game, it's absolutely yeah. insane. You can't even sniff a, a, a foot on, on, on 95. It's bumper to bumper. You're better off taking Metro to get the Metro down downtown. You know, and, yeah, and it, 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 it's tough. It's really tough. You can't drive. Yeah. Park, park and ride, park and ride. Yeah. That's what, that's and, is, you know, what they say. There, there is a rivalry also between um, Washington and the Mets. Um, a lot of that has to do, obviously, with, with getting David uh, Daniel Murphy. Um, yes. And, and, and a piece, and he was, he was just become. It was such a mistake on the, on the ball club's part to, to let him go. And yeah. Um, you know they ended up they're they're, pay, they're paying almost as much now for their second baseman as they were for Murphy, and and he really developed and he developed in that ballpark. And it's, and it's not easy to hit ball hit, hit dingers in, in City Field, and he managed yeah. to learn how to do that. Um, yeah, he the did. Last couple months he was there. Yep. And you know, that's, that's, that's definitely that rivalry between New York and Washington has really come on strong in the last couple of years, even before they they got Murph. That rivalry was happening because they were battling for first place between the two and, yep. and, and until, and, until, uh, uh, Williams got fired and, and lost control of the team. There was still that yeah. battle there. 
and Washington was still going in and, and, and making it miserable for, for the Mets, even though they weren't in it. You know, they still made it miserable. And you could see that that rivalry was starting to fester. And now that they got Murph, oh, my God, it's like we really, we really want to kick butt now come in, and come into your ballpark and beat you with Murph. Murph is a great – he's a great hitter. He's a great hitter, and it, you know, and it was unfortunate what happened to him in the World Series. But you know what? He's rebounded from that. You know, as we say, stuff happens. You know, stuff happens. Unfortunately, it happened. It's like Buckner getting the ball hit between his legs in the World Series between the Mets, you know, for the game winner. You know, it's like, go figure. That's haunting Billy Buckner his whole career, even after his career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it's really, I mean, yeah, and Murph, you know, in many ways, he has a little more power, but he's really no different than the ball player was in the last few months of the 2015 yeah. season. You know, yeah, he, he exactly. came up an additional, an, an additional, you know, 40 some odd plate appearances, uh, with Washington versus the Mets the, the previous season, and he only walked four more times. Yeah. So it's not like he, he completely changed his approach. It's not like he, he became this Curtis Grandison guy who, who went from walking 50 times to walking 90 times. He, sure. um, he walked 35 times last year for the Mets, and um, yeah, he likes to like, swing the bat. He likes to swing the bat. He, 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 he doesn't like taking pitches. He likes he hits what he sees, and yeah. you know, he, he he don't walk much. <laughs> he doesn't walk much. No, nope. you know, and 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 I think that I, I almost wonder if a lot of his progress had a lot to do with first the Mets acquisition of Cespedes in twenty in, in, in July twenty fifteen. And then when yeah. he goes to uh, the Nats, he's right there with Bryce Harper. Now, Bryce Harper yeah. didn't have an amazing season last year. But, you know, and there's a lot of people who don't really believe in, in the psychology of the batting order. But, yeah. you know, this, this is what I see. The guy started hitting home runs and had an impressive clip once he had a powerful guy right behind him. Exactly. You get more fastballs. And that's why his average was so high. They want to pitch around Bryce, but they, they can't pitch around Murph. So they're gonna they're gonna pitch to him. So you can't put you can't put Murph on base by walking him, and then have Harper come up, pitch around him, and walk him. Now you're really deep because the other guys aren't too bad either behind that lineup, you know. So it's all how you 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 put structure the lineup to to give yourself the advantage where Bryce Harper is going to be the benefit to Murphy, and mm-hmm. it's either in front or it's in back. Either way works. Because you're going to help one or the other. One season, one is going to have a, just as good a season as the other is if they get in that spot. And whatever they got working right now should work. And I expect a bigger year out of Harper this year because, you know, now he's married. He maybe he might settle him down a little bit. Who knows? Maybe it might. Maybe it won't. But he, ha- he, he has to. He, point. He, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. As as, I mean, you know, he's looking at. He's looking at those, the reports. He's looking at the whisper. He's listening to the whispers. You know, four hundred million dollars. People are throwing that number out there, which I think yeah. is a little outrageous. But you, if you hear that, if you think that prize is waiting for you, you know, at, at the rainbow two years from now, um, you got to you got to bring it. And, and I think I think he should be in, in career career year mode this year, uh, trying trying to justify those numbers. Exactly, because he wants that four hundred million dollar contract. And I think he's eyeballing it in New York with the Yankees because yeah. that's who wants him. And I'll, and I'll tell you, for him to sign a two-year contract, that's what's on his mind right now. He'll go two years, play for the team that got him there, but then when it comes down to it, right about when he's ready to, to bust loose, again, he'll sign with the Yankees for $400 million and take about a 10, a 10-year poke on that. That's mm-hmm. my guess. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine him in that ballpark? Oh Lord! Yeah, oh, I know Lord. it. it, it it's what, what ridiculous. He, he, put up, he put up great, great numbers in in, in Washington when, and that's kind of a city field esque you know uh, structure. You know, for him yeah. with that with that short right field porch, he'd, he'd be he'd be incredible. He'd be legendary. Oh, how many more home runs? Because he hooks the ball around the foul pole a lot, and a lot of yeah. his balls are foul in Yankee Stadium. They're going to be home runs. You know, it, it, it's like it, it's a perfect scenario for him to go there. Perfect scenario. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and you know it's, it's it's amazing. You know, and we talk about the the, the rivalry between the, the Mets and the Nats. 
The one yeah. that I really don't think gets a whole lot of play, and this could, you could accuse me of trolling all the Cubs fans out there, is the Cubs really didn't have the Mets number last year. That's just no. Six, uh, I think it was six out of seven or something like that, or, or five yeah. out of seven. They, they, yeah, they won five out, of, five out of seven games from them. They swept them in New York. They swept them in the uh, in the playoffs. I mean, the Cubs have nothing to prove, obviously. They won 103 games, and then they, they took their first title in forever. But yeah. I think there's still a nice rivalry between – and there was when the Mets, both the Mets and the Cubs were in the NL East together. Um, oh, yeah. This, this year, you know, the, the, the Cubs still have a little to prove versus uh, the flushing, uh, flushing Mets. Yeah, exactly. There is. There is a rivalry. Always will be a rivalry. They'll always be the cream comes to the top, and they always face each other, and they have no love lost for each other. Those games are the hardest games I've seen in recent recent ball being played. Uh, when you have a team like the Cubs coming at you strong with Chris Bryant and Anthony Rizzo at the corners, it is going to be hell fire. They're going to come at you, and they play hard. They play very hard. And the rest yep. of the team plays the same way. Plus, they know what they're doing. They're instinct baseball players. They know how to play the game. And their manager speaks for himself. Joe Madden's been there. Look what he did last year. Brought the Cubs to a World Series championship. He's going to come hard. Losing Dexter Fowler is going to hurt them a little bit, but they mm-hmm. have the pitching staff. They, they have the bullpen. I don't know about the closing spot now since they lost Ardellis Chapman to New York, but – they're coming on strong with a decent pitching staff, better than decent in the first three guys, and they've got the experience now, which means confidence. And if you got confidence, you can beat anybody. And that's what I see in the Cubbies repeating again in the Central. And as for the fact of the Mets, the Mets are always going to be strong. Terry Collins, can't say enough about him. You know, he's, he's a great manager. He's run the club right. Knows how to knows how to manage. He's a smart man, and he's got the horses there too with the pitching staff. And he's got a great bullpen, and he's got a familia to close you out. Okay, so what can you say? It's a battle that's going to be in a rivalry that's going to still exist, you know, for for years to come. Yeah, and and you hope that the hope the hope is that's that it, you know he wasn't playing for a contract last year really. But he did have the opt out, so he's gotten his money now. He's, he's financially secure. Um, you, you hope that he still plays with the vigor and and, and um, the enthusiasm that he has the last couple of years, because he really is, you know, he is absolutely adored in, in New York City. And, yes. Um, and it's always, it's very much like when um, when the Mets had Dave King, and granted, Dave King wasn't really, or and and Gerald Spiller for that matter, but. Dave King was exciting because you knew it was such a binary situation. It was home run or you strike out. That's right. Every time. All you know, or nothing. All or nothing. And it, it's know. funny, in the, in the Mets Cubs context, I keep thinking about this. And I think he, he finished with some odd, like, 460, 461 home runs, uh, King. And, but his greatest years were in Chicago. And I yes. almost wonder if, if he had stayed there somehow and just worked through it. I mean, he was like a two-time All-Star in, in, in Chicago. He had great – he batted 288 in Chicago and 278 for an, an, in an injury-filled year. I mean, he had his greatest years there. I mean, he was, he, yeah. I, I, wonder, I wonder if things would have changed for him had he stayed there. Well, he would have probably hit more home runs there because of the wind-aided home runs, but I don't think that would have really mattered with Dave Kingman. I saw Dave Kingman hit a ball so far out of left field in Chicago. It went all the way down. Is it Front Street down there? It went down to Front Street and, and yeah. all, the way, all the way down and hit, hit a house and hit the door, and the lady came out to answer, answer the door, thought it was somebody knocking and picked up a baseball. You yeah. know, that's, that's the standard story of Dave Kingman hitting in Chicago. And, right. But remember one thing. Dave Kingman also hit for average in Chicago. Yes. Only time he ever did that. That's right. The only park that he did it. He loved hitting in Chicago. And when I talked to Dave, the reason was he liked the solid green scoreboard in the background because he could see the ball really well. 
that's interesting. Isn't it interesting? That's interesting. Yeah. That's, I've never heard that before. Yeah. And his number was actually 442. Um, yep. But there, there, there's no doubt in my mind, had he stayed in Chicago instead of being swapped to the Mets in 81, or back to the Mets in 81, that we would be looking at a different uh, career path for um, for Kingman overall. Absolutely. 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 Well, obviously, and, obviously yeah. well, were you finish up, Johnny? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I was going to say, but that brings to Cubby and they, the Cardinals have backed up Dexter, who was the center yeah. fielder for the Chicago Cubs last year. So when they get the Cardinals are the Cubs, he just has to walk across. Here and it goes. It's going to be interesting. Well, you know, I think Dexter Fowler was a, one of the big reasons for the Cubs doing so well last year because that kid can go and get a fly ball better than anybody. Right. And he is a he's a mover and shaker on the offensive side where he gets on base, steals a bag, steals another bag, and then you got to, you know, he's very sim- similar. To a lot of a lot of the players, like uh, there was this player uh, on uh, uh, Arizona uh, that got traded to Atlanta, uh, who was the center fielder for the ball club uh, and played left field when AJ Pollock got hurt. And you know, it's that type of player, and uh, uh, I can't I can't I can't remember his name. Right, if AJ Pollock mm-hmm. comes. Comes to to, to all star center fielder that so comes out when you lose an all star center fielder like like the Dex did all of a sudden your your team falls apart that's a man link and you yeah so I don't know we'll see what happens there. You know that's the only yeah. deal, that's the only Achilles heel I see with the Cubbies. Well, and, you know, you know, I think that in in terms of the rivalry, you know, motif and and, and uh, theme that we're talking about here, obviously, the uh, the Indians and, and and the Tigers are going to have a lot to go through this year. The the, Di- the Tigers are going back into um, you know twenty twenty seventeen pretty much untouched. The Indians brought in Incarnacion. I don't know how well he does outside of. Um, you know, leaving the, the cozy confines of uh, Toronto. But yep. um, I think that there's still uh, there's still a lot to be done there between those two. And, and I yep. think that the Detroit Tigers will work for their injuries. And, and the only question mark is whether Berlander has one more, uh, another good season, like his yep. comeback uh, season. So there's that. Um, but, of course, it's the Giants and the Dodgers. And that oh, the classic. The supreme natural rival in Major League Baseball. Oh, yeah. Definitely, you talk about you talk about the giant Dodger rivalry. It goes all the way back to the beginning of time. So, I, I remember I earlier, but in practice for 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 the home team, and we're sitting there taking BP and Tommy. Kind of threw it out, and Charlie talked to get the hell off, and go to the dugout where you belong. And uh, they started getting into words, and start and all of a sudden Charlie popped little sort of right in the nose down in the This is batting practice. The game is and they're the, the right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Not so many. No facts. Okay. So, they're talking about these particulars that are going on in the past years and all the fun that happened. But, you know, it was like, figure. You know, it, it, it was. No, 
bleed best There is also that The Dodgers had a little bit better problems than we did, but I he was not a happy and after the we was in the call. Take care, Johnny. All right, bud. I'll call you right back.